every day, guess how many people are joining and becoming Muslims? 68,000 people every 24 hours are becoming Muslim. The religion of Islam is about your behavior. It's not about my good intentions or my perception of peace and love and, and compassion. It's how I apply that and how I fear my creator in dealing with his creations. Our Islam is founded in the masjid, but it's practiced outside the masjid with everyone, Muslim, non-Muslims, even animals. There was something inside the human being that already had Islam in it. So when they heard the confirmation of what they have deep down inside coming from the mouth of a prophet, there was like a light inside that met the light on the outside. The revelation on the outside that they hear from a prophet is light. The conscience inside of them that knows God already is another light. These two lights come into contact and Islam happens. This concept in the Quran is called light upon light. Nurun ala nur. Two lights. One inside of you, one outside of you. They come into contact with each other. And it is not religion as you may think of it. It is really a way of living. It's really what our life is about. And we're living in a time where many of us are feeling that our deen is open for interpretation. Whereas really, my brothers, the truth is, is that the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been made complete and the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been perfected. The way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the deen to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is complete perfection. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants it and this is how it will remain. And those that try to change it in any way, shape or form, they will fail. Religion unfortunately these days is used by Muslims, by Hindus, by Christians. It is used as a type of manipulation a political manipulation, a type of nationalism. Where is the teachings of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Where in Islam did Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tell us to blow up women and children? But this was Islam. Where in the Quran, where in the Sunnah, where in this beautiful religion ever have we been given any inclination that we should kill women and children and people who are working and going about their daily lives. Where? And we have not sent you, O Messenger of Allah, for any other reason except to be a mercy to the whole world. Except to be a mercy to the whole world. And we believe in something that is far, far, far greater than anything you've ever seen on TV, anything you've ever read about in any book about Islam is far greater than that, is far more beautiful than that. God is far greater than anything you've ever tried to imagine in your mind. The mind cannot comprehend it. Muhammad, peace be upon him, is a man like you've never read about. We love him so much because he gave us this pure religion. This great way of life. What does Islam mean? Islam means submission to Allah, obedience to God's commands. And this, we believe, is the way of life. It is the religion that God has and always had ordained and decreed for human beings to follow. That Moses, Abraham, Noah, Jacob, the prophet sent to the children of Israel, including John the Baptist and Jesus, and of course God's last and final messenger, Muhammad. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon all of his messengers. We believe all of these messengers were Muslim, people who submitted to God. The way of living that they followed was a way of submission and surrender to the Creator. About 1,400 years ago, when the Prophet Muhammad was born, the world had reached its final stage. Humanity had entered into a final era. And that it was time for a final message, a message that was not only for a particular place and for a particular time, 
but a message that was suitable and a detailed guidance that was suitable and is suitable for humanity all the way up until the day of judgment. Our belief are number one the Shahada or the testimony of faith. That is to testify and bear witness that Allah alone is worthy of worship and that Muhammad is the servant and the messenger of Allah. The second is the five obligatory ritual prayers that every Muslim has to pray five times every day within certain time frames, within a certain time period. So these are the five daily prayers. And so with the zakat, that is the obligatory amount of money that every Muslim has to give from the excess wealth annually to certain categories of people. Also the fasting month of Ramadan where Muslims abstain from eating and drinking and from intimate relations between the husband and the wife from dawn until sunset. And then of course the Hajj or the pilgrimage to Mecca. So these are the famous five pillars of Islam. Our belief in Allah, our belief in the angels, in the books that God has revealed throughout the ages and the messengers and the prophets whom Allah has sent. The events that are going to happen before the day of judgment, the life in the grave, the day of judgment itself and the paradise and the hellfire. Our belief in decree of God but there are also many other acts of worship that a Muslim performs. For example, supplication or dua or asking God for things. The issue of the animals that we are permitted to eat and the animals that we are prohibited to eat. And the same with drinks. And also the whole issue of financial transactions. What sort of transactions are allowed and what sort of transactions are prohibited? For example, one of the things that is strongly condemned is something called riba, which is often translated as interest. So we find that the sharia is a comprehensive and complete way of life that has guidance for all aspects of the human being. It not only teaches us how we live our life, but also matters of interaction between the human being between the husband and the wife, between the ruler and the ruled, between the teacher and the taught. And it may come as a surprise to even some Muslims that Islam has an economic system. The Quran also details laws by which rulers should govern and judges should judge. All of these things are taught to us and detailed to us in the Sharia. And it is the way that leads us to that which we as Muslims desire and hope for, which of course is the pleasure of God and the paradise. Why would they consider Islam the enemy? When we look on the African continent and much of the world, we find spiritually people are confused. Man worship is on the rise. Magic, the Sahara, magicians are rising up in all countries in different forms. There is a spiritual vacuum, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us Iyaka na'budu wa Iyaka nasta'in. You alone, Allah, do we worship. And from you alone do we seek help. Islam is not an attack, it is life-giving. And for us in the southern region, and in many parts of the world, we see clearly people transforming in front of our eyes. It is a life-giving way. In the economic sphere, the system of usury and interest is killing us. The domination of the bankers, 
the inequalities of the rich and the poor. This poverty is stripping human beings of dignity. And we see it, harsh poverty. Millions of Muslims starving to death. The bottom line is that Islam is life-giving, an interest-free system that would liberate this planet. In the social sphere, alcohol, gambling, it's killing us. Drugs are ravaging all of our communities. Go to the younger generation. See what the problem is that they are facing. And people who cannot take the pressure are resorting to drugs. Islam is a life-giving way to take a person out of a drug habit, to take a person out of addiction to gambling, to purify their life. This is the savior of humanity. In areas of health, we have seen with our eyes the life-giving virtues of Islam. In some parts of the southern region, one in every three people is HIV positive. One in three. But when a person takes purification into their life, purifies their belief, purifies their body, purifies their home, purifies their sexual relationships, they have a shield against the scourge of HIV AIDS. Islam is life-giving and we have seen in Uganda that at one point had the highest percentage of people who were HIV positive. The Muslims took the lead, implemented Islam and they were able to lower the percentage of HIV faster than anybody else on the face of the planet Earth. Islam in the family, it is the last hope for the family. And that it clearly shows that a man is a man and a woman is a woman. It is life-giving and it is the only hope for the savior of the family. On a political sphere, we have the potential to bring to people a system where the politician is the most trustworthy person in the community. Today it's the opposite. If you said John or Ali has become a politician, in most parts of the world, it means he's a crook. He'll say one thing before the election and do something after the election. But the Islamic system is the rule of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not the rule of man-made systems. It is the rule that frees us from the limitations of our thinking and the weaknesses inside of ourselves. Why are we still suffering in the way that we suffer? We cry for change. We cry for economics. We cry for leadership. But Allah has told us, Allah will not change the condition of a people till they change that which is in themselves. No change. Do you think it is by chance? Are you here because you're slaves of the colonial system? And now you're trying to get hot and cold water. Are you here because of the shopping mall? We are here to stand up for this faith and to get this message across to the people. And that's why Islam spread and still spreading exponentially. The largest Muslim country in the world, Indonesia. You know, there was no battle to open Indonesia for Islam. It was four merchants. When they went to the market after accepted Islam, to the shock of everybody, they said, you know what, before we quote you the price, this is what's wrong with that piece of textile. This is what's wrong with that horse. People were shocked. And after they'd done their business, people asked them, we never seen that honesty and your demeanor and your cleanliness. What's going on? What do you call that? They call that Islam. And these Indonesians that actually asked that question and accepted Islam, they did not accept Islam as a title, but the mannerism of Islam that these people showed. And that's how 230 million Indonesians are Muslims today. Every prophet tried to connect people's inner light with the light of revelation. That's what every prophet tried to do. So Islam is a means by which peace is attained, harmony is attained inside a person, within their family, within a community, within the world. It starts at the individual level and you finally are finally at peace with yourself. Someone who's living a life of rebellion, 
you know, a life of partying and think they're going to live, eat, sleep, party in this world and eventually go, you'll find this one thing they don't have. They don't have peace. They can't sit still. They're always dissatisfied. And when someone finds Islam, Allah gives them the one thing they will never find in any amount of money, any amount of luxury, any amount of entertainment, any amount of you know, self-indulgence or pleasure. They won't find satisfaction anywhere else, tranquility anywhere else except for Islam. That's why you find the people that have the most money and people want to be like them be they musicians, actors, whoever people make it big and they can basically have any pleasure they want drowning themselves in drugs so they don't have to deal with reality because they can't find peace in reality these are people that have the best of the best of the best and can't live with it Islam offers them that peace a heart penetrating counsel has come to you from your master and what has come to you is a cure for what is in the chest God specifically mentions the problem is where? in the chest People's hearts are unsatisfied. Whether you're afflicted with jealousy or rage or sadness or disappointment or fear or greed or lust or whatever your problem is inside, it starts getting cured. You're at peace with yourself and others because you're at peace with God now. After this cure, now it's guidance. Once it cures you, you'll see the way to follow. Once you see that way to follow, congratulations, you've attained the best thing you could have possibly attained, both for this world and the next. You'll live, live a happy life here, and you'll live a happy life in the hereafter. People think when they follow religion, they'll miss out on life. If guidance is in your heart, then the world can be in your hands, and you'll be fine. And when guidance is not in your heart, then the world and its temptations are in your heart. Nothing is in your hands. You have nothing in your hands. You can have the world in your hands, just have guidance in your heart.